we have a discussion on regulating big tech companies. With the 2018 General Data Regulation, Protection Regulation, or GDPR, many people believe that the European Union has become the de facto global regulator of technology. One of the foremost voices in the EU on behalf of tech regulation is Mauritia Schaka. Mauritia represented the Netherlands as a member of the European Parliament from 2009 to 2019, where she focused on trade, foreign policy, and technology and she initiated the net neutrality law that's now in effect throughout Europe. Mauritia is a member of the Transatlantic Commission on Election Integrity, the Global Commission on the Stability of Cyberspace, and the European Council on Foreign Relations. I'm also really, really pleased to say that Mauritia, as of this week, has joined Stanford University in a full-time capacity as High's inaugural International Policy Fellow. She's also jointly appointed at the new Cyber Policy Center at Stanford. Joining Mauritia will be Eric Schmidt, who is technical advisor and board member to Alphabet. Eric joined Google in 2001 and served as CEO and executive chairman. Prior to Google, he was the CEO of Novell, chief technology officer at Sun Microsystems, and on the research staff at Xerox Palo Alto Research Center and Bell Laboratories. Mauritia and Eric, the floor is yours. So what we thought we would do is uh, have me make a few comments and then have you make some comments and then have you lead Q&A on, on sort of everything we talk about, anything else the audience is interested in. I, I'm really delighted to be a member of the advisory board for the HAI. I think that uh, what Stanford is doing here is, is historic in many, many ways. And I'm reminded that ethics is a system of moral principles and that it's important that we debate now the ethics of what we're doing, and that we debate now the impact that the technology that we're building is going to have on, on everything. So, so we're here fundamentally because we want to have an open debate, uh, not just for this stuff, but for the things that will be invented and so forth in the next five or 10 years. But we want to make sure that the systems that we're building are built on our values, on human values, right? Which is why this conference exists. It's why HAI exists and it's why the research is so integrated. Um, a couple of updates of things that are gonna happen fairly soon are that uh, I happen to be fortunate enough to be the chairman of a National Security Commission on Artificial Intelligence, which uh, will report its first report on November 5th in uh, DC at a big event uh, in the Congress. And it's a, this particular group was chartered by the Congress to look at AI, the impact of AI on society, national security, and so forth and so on. Um, a few days earlier, the Defense Innovation Board, of which I'm also the chairman, is hopefully going to debate and approve a proposal for the DOD ethics and the use of AI in ethical ways for the DOD. Uh, I, this is just a reminder that this work is ongoing, and I encourage you all to look at it and, and discuss it and, and give feedback. But, but my goal in those two initiatives is to sort of build a national consensus AI strategy for the U.S., where you know, roughly 30 countries already have these, right? but we don't seem to have one, and yet it's so central to what we do in universities, among our students, among our business, and for our nation. So, so one way to think about it is that in the last few years, we've gone from a relatively simple AI stack to a very complicated one. And this new AI stack, uh, which is a combination of deep learning and reinforcement learning, is extraordinarily powerful. And I wanna give you some examples of some of the things that you can do and talk about the positive impacts of some of this on the thing I care a lot about now, which is science. And much of this work is going on here at Stanford. The, it's clear, and this is all published information, that we've already, with the current technology, which is largely labeled data and sophisticated vision algorithms, um, have detected lung cancer earlier. We can predict heart, um, heart attacks and strokes from your retina. Uh, we can detect the spread of breast cancer tumors uh, much earlier. This will save or help millions of people over the next five or 10 years as it deploys. This stuff works, it's done, it's in the bank. People are building companies and businesses and so forth around it. Google, for example, automatically captions one billion YouTube videos in 10 different languages, something which would be not economically possible. You can imagine the benefit of that to, to, to global diffusion of information. 
Um, and indeed, TensorFlow is now uh, open and, and, and very, very broadly used. I, I think folks here probably know that TensorFlow is a library which started off essentially as a, think of it as matrix multiplication, which is what tensors are. Um, but it's really a, a set of algorithms and procedures that do the powerful algorithms that I'm going to talk about. And it's been extended and, and so forth, and it's being used pretty much by everybody now. Um, and what's interesting about TensorFlow is that the extensions, and again, this is through open source and other partnerships, in say physics and statistics, which recent libraries that have been added, are changing the way people think about using AI in these fields, right? It's a new way of solving a problem. Uh, this is new in the sense that this stuff wasn't available a year ago. These are the newest tools to do whatever it is that you care about. Um, and one of the things that Google did is we invented something called federated learning um, and popularized it and also open sourced it. And federated learning can be understood as allowing multiple computers to learn in pieces so that collectively you can do things faster and you can do things at scale and with certain kind of privacy pr protections. Now, Along the way, I had assumed that natural language processing was the sort of stepchild of all of this, and I couldn't have been wrong, more wrong. Um, and a team, again, from Google released a, a technique called BERT, which can be understood as the first really scalable self-supervision system. What it does, just so you understand, is it runs around and it learns from things like Wikipedia, um, and uh, books corpus and a few other things, and it self-trains. That's a very big deal. And much to my surprise, right, credit to the inventors of this, this self-training and based on that sort of rather disaggregated set of data has produced extremely interesting um, insights in terms of, I don't know, context and concepts in natural language, and we can use this in all sorts of new tasks. Uh, question answering and so forth and so on. A typical example is that you can take some words out and it'll put them back in. It figures all that stuff out. And it looks to me like NLP, which in my view had been sort of sitting around for a while, has now gotten a very significant boost by virtue of the BERT approach. And more importantly, I think it illustrates that there's much to do. That self-supervised learning, the notion of doing it on your own as a computer, is relatively new. Uh, most of the things and systems that you use today in AI have been with label data. And indeed, the examples that I use with you know, breast cancer and, and uh, vision and things like that uh, and healthcare are largely from label data. But there's a scale problem with labeling data and so forth. So, so with this, right, the combination of GANs, which I'll talk about in a sec, and reinforcement learning means that you really can begin to, to do things at scale that are sort of magical. Right. And that has a lot of implications for the things I'll talk about in a bit about ethics. So, so for me, w there is a set of questions that this begins to ask, and I'll begin to develop these by saying that we don't really understand today how humans and AI will coexist together. Right? I've given you very specific task-oriented examples, language understanding, vision, and so forth. But we don't fully understand how this interaction will Will deal, how people will deal with it. We don't have exactly the user interfaces. You know, 50 years ago, the Windows icons, menus, and pull-down interface was invented at Xerox PARC, and uh, we use that today without thinking about it. It had an enormous impact. What is the equivalent of that? It's obviously not going to be the WIMP interface from way back when. But how do we combine a human decision and an AI decision into this? So, so if you look at AI and speech and images, I would say that these, at least at the first pass, are solved problems. They're equal to or better than human capability, and that has a lot of implications. So for example, that's why self-driving cars make sense. It's just much better to have the car drive you rather than you because it doesn't get tired and it doesn't get drunk and it doesn't have accidents like you do. Um, and that's happening. Again, these are things which we know will happen. The question is what, what additionally will happen. So, We've made a lot of progress, for example, here with object recognition and so forth, but we have a lot of things that we're still working there. So for example, true deep scene understanding, understanding for everyone, sort of low resource languages. There's lots of languages that aren't the ones that all of us speak. Um, true conversational handling of um, turns. It turns out that one of the hard research questions is how do you detect when a conversation goes from one person to another very back and forth quickly? I'm familiar with a research project 
which has as a thesis that the rate of such turns with a child, in terms of velocity of turns, is an indicator or perhaps driving their, uh, their intellectual development as a young child. This is at, at very young ages. We'll see if that's true, but it turns out it's hard to detect that. Right? So there's an example of where we are in that frontier. But to me, the thing that, that we're going to see now is the combination of the things I've talked about are going to transform science. And I want to give you some examples. So what happens in, in science is they have, and I now have talked to enough people to understand, they have an enormous amount of data that's very, very confusing. And if you look, pretty much all of the interesting AI approaches in science right now have a GAN in the middle of it. And for those of you who aren't familiar with GANs, GANs are where there's essentially two networks, one which is generating one, and one is which is approving or disapproving it. And because the two work together, eventually they can produce things which are, which are normalized, right, and look similar to the underlying data. Pretty much any interesting application that I've seen in science has, as, has a GAN in the middle of it, which is trying to take all the sort of lossy data and the strange data and turn it into something which then can be manipulated. This, this hard science is about um, finding robust and reproducible patterns in this data. And so there is an opportunity where these models are very, very good at this. I had originally thought when this was first presented to me that somehow you just sort of run this stuff and it would figure it out. That's not true. It turns out you need much more sophisticated pipelines. This is the work that is going on at Stanford in research and many, many other places and the top universities in the country and so forth at Google and elsewhere. So when you add these generative models like GANs and then reinforcement learning, which uses a simulator, all of a sudden things go much faster. So anywhere where data is easily collected and then normalized um, or where there's very little computational analysis in the field, which covers a fair amount of science, these things are appropriate. Now, the combination of these things will produce historic results. Uh, AlphaFold, which is from DeepMind, um, has just recently won one of the protein folding uh, competitions. The algorithm is essentially an energy management problem where you have to find the lowest energy state for a complicated set of uh, proteins as they, as, they, uh, as they move around and they fold. And this is computationally very, very difficult. And what it shows, and if you study AlphaFold as an example, that the generic solution is going to be something like this that you'll take a data, the data into some sort of GAN, you'll get some sort of normalized data, and then you'll use reinforcement learning to discover a function that was not known to you before, a transformation of A to B. Um, where will this apply? Pretty much anywhere that's interesting and hard. Quantum chemistry, molecular binding, drug discovery, climate forecasting, complicated energy flows, uh, anything involving Navier-Stokes, those sorts of things. Why do I spend so much time talking about this? Because what happens when this technology in the next decade can allow us to build extraordinarily powerful new materials, right, to understand fundamentally what's going on with the climate in a way we didn't before? Much more efficient energy generation. This is all good. This is really, really powerful. And I don't want us in these complicated debates about what we're doing to forget that the scientists here at Stanford and other places are making progress on problems which were thought to be unsolvable that have not been solved for 50 years or 100 years because they couldn't do the math at scale, simply because of the way physics works. So I think that there's a set of issues, and then there's a set of really hard problems. And I'm going to define issues as ones which we can, I think, address relatively easily. Not easily, that's over understatement. That can be addressed. So the, one of the first questions about AI systems is we want them to be in a situation where the end users are in control and they get what they want. Right? This is the problem of, you know, I built it and it didn't do what I wanted. And of course, movies are full of these scenarios. It's incredibly important that the AI systems that we collectively build, including the ones that I've highlighted and many others, have human control. Right? Our legal systems, our ethical systems, all are based on these sorts of principles. We don't want rogue things running around in, in the vernacular of movies. So, so how, do we, how do we get it so the end users that are using the systems have more control over them? And I mean more than like and dislike. How does that training actually work? Right? This is an area of extremely active research. Um, we, we just don't want uh, the AI just exploiting our impulses and obsessions and anxiety. Um, this is critical to the sustainable uh, adoption of AI. I'll give you another example, data. Many people, including myself, believe that if 
broadly speaking, healthcare data was broadly available, and we had the equivalent of ImageNet for healthcare data. Uh, we would make enormous progress for diseases that have bedeviled humans since we've been around thousands of years. Um, we're not going to do that because it's a violation of privacy, it's not appropriate, and so forth and so on. So how do we solve that problem? How do we get to the point where we can get enough training data while respecting privacy? Right? Again, I'm not suggesting we, we do anything other than respect privacy. I think it's a fundamental ethical value. On the other hand, there really is a need, at least in the research community, to get this data to solve a disease, right? And if you have the disease, all of a sudden your view of this gets very, very motivated. Um, and then how do you get access to the right data and to the right people in such a way that it's not misused? There's a lot of work here and elsewhere around bias. And um, an example of a contribution that Google has made is called ten something called TensorFlow Lattice. Um, it allows you to manage bi bias data. There's a tool, these are open source facets to understand it. There's something called model analysis to see the, de uh, the data and what if to visualize the data right, in different forms of bias. We know the data has bias in it. Don't, you don't need to uh, yell that as a new fact, right? Because humans have bias in them. Our systems have bias in them. It's like not a shock. The question is, what do we do about it? So at least at the current state of the art, we can help you understand the, the bias and identify it. The real question to me is that an ethical matter, how do you address it? Another thing that's important, and I think we're getting there as an industry, is, is I'm going to say this is good judgment is required. Uh, two examples. Um, in Google's case, we've been very, very careful about sensitive things like face recognition uh, for obvious reasons. Uh, if you look at OpenAI, which is essentially a partner with Google in many of these things, um, they withheld the public details of GPT-2, which is a text service that generated arbitrary text, um, and they allowed it for research use, but they didn't publish it, so they didn't want it to be misused. These are two examples of good judgment, and I think there's going to be more such examples, and it's important that we establish the basis for that good judgment and that the people who are doing this sort of really think about it before they sort of release these things. I mentioned before the issue of control. This is a subject of research issue as well as, as sort of uh, academic, academic interest and, and business interest. You really need to know, right, that in the corner cases of these algorithms, nothing weird happens. There's a great deal of interest in China. I think the China problem is solvable with the following insight. We need access to their top scientists, right? We are better off collectively when their top scientists, the incredible talent that is there and in other countries, is here in our country working on these things. Um, and we also benefit from common frameworks, uh, TensorFlow being an example, and there are a number of other ones. And I would argue that even in a situation where everybody hates each other among all the countries and they can't get along and they don't agree on anything, there are still areas of common agreement. The most obvious one is you have a country that's doing experiments. Let's say it has some horrific cyber thing that it's experimenting with. Um, not the US, but somebody else. And clearly, it's not in their interest or in our interest for this to escape from its testing harness. Right? You are, so there are all sorts of ways, and imagine you can imagine treaties and agreements among countries to try to mitigate the worst possible scenarios, the one that everybody wants to talk about. I think there's some really hard issues. Um, I think this fake video thing and the impact of misinformation is a really hard issue. It's hard at a sociological level. It's hard at a technical level. Google made a data set of visual fakes for detection for the research community following one with um, uh, one involving text, and for, excuse me, for synthetic speech. This is a case where the researchers have to win. It's important that we develop techniques to detect these things and to be able to handle them. We don't want a world which is nothing but misinformation, where everybody is an audience of one and where everything is marketed to by some evil government in some other country and so forth, all of the scenarios that we talk about. It's important that the technology that we have invented be used in a way that increases trust, increases ethical use of information, and doesn't dumb it down. I'm very worried about uh, the issues of deterrence. So uh, I'm, I'm good friends with a number of people who worked hard to make the world that we, are, we have now safe from nuclear weapons. And when you talk to them about how they did deterrence and how they did all of the negotiations at the time, 
Um, and these are heroes, in my view, because we're all alive, basically, because of the work that they did. Um, they, they talk about the scarcity of the weapons and the, the ability to count them and the ability to sort of know what others were doing. And often, one of the techniques would be that one side would tell the other what they knew. Well, none of these principles apply in what I would imagine would be software negotiations for many, many reasons. Software is, is diffuse. You wouldn't tell the other side what you had done. I mean, I, I, again, I'm making these things up in my own mind. But we haven't had a proper um, regime around how all of that works. So if you have the Secretary of State of one country and the Secretary of State of another country having this conversation, what are the ground rules? And it's pretty clear, by the way, that because AI is incredibly powerful, um, that there will be negative issues. There will be negative uses. I'm not arguing against that. So how do you talk about it? Does one side disclose it to the other? Well, no one would naturally do that. What are the norms of this? This area strikes me as one which is an, a nascent beginning, but likely to become very important um, as general intelligence becomes more and more possible, which is some time from now, of course. Um, when this technology, another hard issue is the technologies that I'm talking about will largely first come out in government form or in commercial form. So for example, in China, the surveillance uh, technology, uh, which is, as a technical matter, well done, has had a, a sort of terrible impact, right? So that's the first use that those folks have seen of the power of AI. Well, that's not the first use I would like them to see of AI. How do we sort that out? Um, this notion of sort of ubiquity of this technology and how do people experience it will also color how our technology is treated. And I think it's also important that we establish right here, right now, that the liberal values of Stanford and of the university and Western values are the ones that should win, right? That we shouldn't allow other values, right? Which we can debate what they are specifically, but we need to be unified and clear on that. So there are lots and lots of upcoming issues. My, my favorite current one is the following. So in the, in the reasonable future, not in the next year or two, it'll be possible for you, let's say you're a, a somewhat into middle age kind of an adult and you're kind of bored with your normal life. And so what you do is you put a headset on for the day and you live a life of your younger self. And that virtual world that you live in is populated with the virtual images of your friends who are themselves younger, more handsome, more beautiful, more energetic, richer, whatever, um, more, more hip. What do you think about that? What do you think about, um, uh, the term I use there is called crossing over. Right? What do you think about people who would choose to do that? Is that a good thing or a bad thing as they sort of leave our current physical world except for things like eating right? and they go into that? Now, is that a likely scenario? Take a look at 3D gaming today and imagine 10 years from now. You can do this with many, many different technologies and we need to start having those debates. What I want to say here in finishing up is that um, this I start from the premise that this technology is extraordinarily beneficial. I think the evidence is there. The ability to deal with disease alone, right, which has bedeviled all of us and our ancestors and our parents and our children and so forth and so on. I mean, what a gift, and I can go on. Think of the number of people who will be alive because a car doesn't kill them. I mean, I can just go on and on and on and on. Um, I also think that we're just beginning to see the impact of this technology on the really, really powerful things in science, right? whether it's disease discovery, understanding how the basics of energy work, and so forth and so on. And we will see that benefit in the same sense that we saw the benefit of electricity you know, 100 years later. I think that the optimism that I would offer for a research perspective is that I think we know what the next set of things are. Right? that the combination of the GANs that I talk, talked about, um, this sort of self-supervised learning maneuvers, reinforcement learning, and the development of broad simulators, or at least specific simulators, will enable these extraordinary gains in the next five years. I cannot wait to see what next year and the following year look like from the power of what is happening here. So thank you very much. <laughs> Would you like to go ahead? Thank you.
Thank you. Um, I'm going to talk about governance. We can see if it's a problem or an issue, uh, one of the two. It's certainly a hot topic. Um, earlier this week, I was doing a debate in New York organized by Intelligence Squared where the proposition was in an Oxford-style debate, Europe has declared war on the American tech companies. And I was kind of wishing that the debate would have taken place one week later because then the proposition might have been American Congress has declared war on the American tech companies. So in that light, you know, merely talking about regulating big tech already sounds like an olive branch. But very clearly in Europe and the United States and frankly globally, questions of governance to safeguard the rule of law, the public interest and the protection of indiv individual rights, collective rights amidst technological change and geographical power shifts is at the top of the agenda. I think the biggest question is how do we implement regulation? And I would say starting with principles that we protect for very, very good reason is a much more productive approach than to suggest that techno technologies are so exceptional that they can only be regulated by entirely new systems or models. Firstly, we don't have the time or really the ability to start from scratch if there if ever is such an opportunity in governing, but especially now in these polarized times and global, uh, globally tense times, I think uh, it is just not going to work that way. But more importantly, there's too much that is of enormous value in the human rights frameworks and other fundamental principles that we have uh, to simply discard them. Now, an often heard argument, especially in this part of the world, is that governments should refrain from regulating technology or the internet because it would stifle innovation. Maybe this sounds familiar. But I think the zero-sum dichotomy is a caricature. In fact, arguing that implies that innovation is more important than democracy or the rule of law, the foundations of our quality of life. And I believe actually, that some of the most serious challenges to our open societies, but also to the open internet today, do not stem from over, but rather under regulation of technologies. Now, the idea that tech companies are categorically against regulation is paradoxical for many reasons, because they have directly and also significantly benefited from regulations, such as Section 230 intermediary liability exemptions. And actually, companies themselves are increasingly governing very impactful parts of our economies, societies, and democracies. Terms of use are often a stronger indicator than legal articles of what hundreds of millions of people experience in terms of content when they go online. Google processes approximately 63,000 searches a second. Verizon and MasterCard verify your identity and payments online. Uber knows your every move. Microsoft is now going to build the Defense Department's cloud, while Facebook decides who can and cannot be trusted as a new source. There is a lot of power in the hands of very few actors. And not only does that make it very difficult for newcomers to catch up in terms of creating data volumes, private companies are increasingly taking over crucial parts and the role of governments, uh, but without an explicit mandate and without democratic legitimacy, without the kind of accountability that's proportionate to the powers that they assume. So I believe principally, and I really look forward to being part of that debate here at Stanford, we need a deeper debate about which tasks need to stay in the hands of the public, out of the market. I think about questions around currency, defensive but also offensive capabilities, critical infrastructure, personal data, identity, including your own genetic structures. We need to talk about what should be in the public, not in the market. Now, when the internet was designed and shared, many had hoped and even hinted that access to it as such would harbor and spread democracy, and others thought that the internet would actually technically be ungovernable. I think we must look at what we've learned from the promise of the open internet and where we are today in practice. I'm sure you will all remember the famous words by John Perry Barlow in his Declaration of Independence of Cyberspace. I quote, we are forming our own social contract. This governance will arise according to the conditions of our world, not yours. Our world is different. We are creating a world where anyone, 
anywhere may express his or her beliefs, no matter how singular, without fear of being coerced into silence or conformity. Your legal concepts of property, expression, identity, movement, and context do not apply to us. This was around 20 years ago in Davos. And I often think back uh, about the echo of John Perry Barlow's words as a bit of a reality check when I hear evangelists about artificial intelligence, but also blockchain, which kind of is more in the background now, it seems. But the notion or the suggestion that there is no time to lose or that in a G2 world, a race to AI dominance will determine geopolitical relations for a decade to come. Now, on the significance of AI, I, I don't disagree, but the question is not merely who dominates, but very much the question of which values and principles will be underpinning this kind of power and leadership. Certainly, a race for AI power must not be an excuse for a race to the bottom where innovation, efficiency, or competition trump the safeguarding of public interests, fair competition, human rights, or democratic principles. And then this is a question that really has me thinking a lot these days. If AI benefits disproportionately from an undemocratic and centrally governed model, such as the one we see in China, but also other parts of the world, where data can be massively hoovered up without much restriction and where human rights are not respected, and if AI in turn will make that undemocratic government more powerful, why do we have such high expectations of what this technology will bring us, especially if we don't have the proper rules, checks, and balances. And if AI is not inherently an accelerator of top-down control, we need to look at governance and regulation even more ambitiously. I believe that if we want to preserve democracy, we need to democratize the way in which we govern technology itself. And it's a little ironic to put it mildly that the same companies that are warning against the dominance of Chinese standards are in fact sending data to Beijing themselves. I heard Mark Zuckerberg warning lawmakers on Capitol Hill for China as the alternative to Facebook's proposed Libra currency. But the company has data sharing partnerships with four Chinese companies, including Huawei. And you cannot imagine, during the 10 years that I spent in European Parliament, how often I heard from tech lobbyists, do not regulate us because otherwise China, dot, dot, dot. They will use our laws as a legitimation of theirs. And we can safely conclude right now that that argument has not led to successful outcomes for democracies so far. Inaction to regulate by democracies has not stopped Chinese leaders from instrumentalizing tech, mirroring communist values and political mo models. In fact, the asymmetry in governance becomes ever larger when democratic countries from re refrain from ensuring a values and rules-based framework that creates benchmarks to protect principles such as the freedom of expression, access to information, non-discrimination, fair competition, presumption of innocence, and when we do not develop a vision for our relation to developing economies and trade relations as AI also impacts data flows across the world. We see China using technology as an extension of its governance model that is increasingly global, while the US mainly lets technology and thus business models speak for themselves. Except, and I find this interesting uh, and puzzling sometimes, except when it comes to national security, which always seems the exception for Americans when they do see a significant role for government. European privacy laws should be seen as an intention to protect people from government intrusion as much as overreach by private companies. Since World War II, the rules-based order was seen as a key priority for Western democracies, from trade to human rights, from democracy to, trade, uh, to war and peace norms. And for norms to have meaning, they need to be enforceable and violators held to account. So we need more guarantees and institutions, processes, than just stated good intentions of what I used to call uh, in the European Parliament, scouts honor, you know, when companies say, we, we promise we're really 
going to do good. Um, and I'm not even sure that, that such explicit intentions are made anymore. Um, I don't know if do no evil is still Google's motto, um, but it's really about more than promises. We heard about the need for redistribution of, of benefits, for example, in the first panel. Now, you know, which government would say, okay, if that's your intention, a uh, big tech company, that's fine, go ahead. Or do we need taxation and other kinds of redistribution mechanisms that apply equally in place? Uh, I would say we do. But what we can see so far is that in part led by the success of Silicon Valley businesses and its culture, the US took a more libertarian approach and certainly did not seek to build and safeguard a rules-based order in the digital sphere uh, or let's say an internet whole and at peace. And we now know that this hands-off approach did not break monopolies but created new ones, empowered not only individuals but also companies and dictators, disrupted journalism and electoral processes and did not prevent the balkanization of the internet. It certainly did not nudge China into following our example. And I've not mentioned explicitly uh, inequality, discrimination, job displacement and the environmental damage that we also have to be very mindful of and that AI can put on steroids. And I'm very glad Joy is here. Uh, we'll he hear from her later because she will talk about some of the uh, risks of exacerbating discrimination um, that can happen when data that is being put into the training of algorithms and AI is biased or flawed uh, for many reasons. But because digitization often means privatization, it means that the outsourcing of governance to tech companies, technologies and algorithms built for profit, efficiency, competitive advantage, time spent online, ads sold, certainly not uh, designed to safeguard or strengthen democracy is a process that's happening. I believe that the shift to private and opaque governance through technological standards is one of the most significant consequences of AI that we need to shed more light on. Laura Lessig's work, Code is Law, is in that sense more relevant than ever. But the reality is, and for lawmakers this is an inconvenient truth, is that the full impact of the massive use of tech platforms and AI remains largely unknown. Academics, regulators, law enforcement, lawmakers, judges, civil society, journalists and citizens alike have an information deficit compared to companies, even if their impact is public for both good, and we've heard a lot about opportunities, but also harmful. And also companies may look at the same data through a completely different lens and with the aim of achieving completely different goals than uh, the, sta uh, the um, uh, stakeholders that I mentioned um, may have. And actually many AI engineers will admit that no person really knows anymore where the head and the tail of algorithms are after endless iterations. They're excited about the fact that outcomes are not predictable. And I can understand that excitement. But we can only know what the unintended outcomes are when we know what was intended in the first place. When there's transparency of training data and documentation of intended outcomes and variations of algorithms. And on top of that, regulators and auditors, as well as other public servants, will need to get mandates and capacity for meaningful access to data and information. I think the example of Cambridge Analytica is interesting. It is often seen as an abuse of Facebook's platform. But I believe it actually simply used the platform the way that was possible without restrictions on data collection, micro-targeting, data sharing, and the use of political advertisement. The same goes for multiple other disinformation campaigns. So in assessing all the possibilities and opportunities that AI offers, as well as its potential harm, we must explicitly look both at use and abuse, the intended and the unintended. But the Cambridge Analytica scandal anecdotally shows how huge the accountability gap is. And we see this with every data breach or cyber attack over and over again, because too often no one faces meaningful consequences. Without transparency, no accountability, 
and a real risk of disenfranchisement of citizens who see powerless public authorities in the face of very powerful events happening and impacting their lives. Now, trade secrets and other intellectual property protections cannot be the perpetual shield against meaningful access to information and oversight. It's a fairly cynical cycle where companies claim that politicians don't know anything about technology so that so, you know, they can only but propose bad regulations and laws when in fact the most important information is carefully guarded. This cycle has to be broken. And if trade secrets stands between us and scrutiny, that has to change. Another argument I often hear is it's too early to regulate artificial intelligence. But at the same time, many people agree that we were too late to regulate platform companies, micro-targeting, political ad data protection and privacy online. And you know, perhaps the timing is never perfect, but I would prefer to be proactive and not wait until there are further uh, harms or, or uh, other effects of AI. And, and let's, let's be proactive while we can be. Now this conference will deal a lot with ethics frameworks and it's, it's a very popular topic. It's also hard to be against ethics, I believe. And that may explain that there are now around 128 frameworks of AI and ethics in Europe alone. But if everything is ethics, nothing is. And the question is, who design, designs and oversees ethics standards? Who decides what is or who is an ethically competent leader? And what happens in cases of breach? In other words, how do we make sure that it is meaningful and enforceable and not just window dressing and a distraction? AI development should promote fairness and justice, protect the rights and interests of stakeholders and promote equality of opportunity. AI should promote green development and meet the requirements of environmental friendliness and resource conservation. AI systems should continuously improve transparency, explainability, reliability and controllability, and gradually achieve auditability, supervisability, traceability and trustworthiness. I can go on, there's a fairly long list and it's interesting because I was reading from principles of AI governance and responsible AI produced by the National New Generation of Artificial Intelligence Governance Expert Committee in China. This was produced on June 17th, 2019. And I want to thank uh, Laurent Lascaille and Graham Webster from New America because they made available uh, the translation. I think it's, it's worth a read because when you read these ethics principles, they sound quite accessible and agreeable, but clearly uh, they have not quite solved the challenges between, for example, this country uh, and China. And I personally believe we can, we can do with more focus on the rule of law uh, than on ethics and on empowering the institutions we have to perform the tasks of regulating antitrust, the handling of personal data, net neutrality, the application of media laws online, consumer rights, safety and technical standards, et cetera, et cetera. Again, we don't have to start from scratch. And this is not about regulating the internet or regulating against big tech companies, this is about preserving principles, standards and values, no matter what technological disruption. It's certainly unrealistic to assume a sort of broad societal and political trust in artificial intelligence, especially after so much trust has been lost by tech companies and in failed self-regulation efforts. I think it's difficult for companies to want to have it both ways. While on the one hand making big promises to customers or advertisers about the extraordinary efficiency with which ads can be connected to internet users. And on the other hand, when you say, well, we have to start thinking about the potential harms of machine learning to say, oh, you know, we're not that far yet. Uh, AI is really in its early stages. Um, one of the things that continues to puzzle me is how companies like YouTube or Facebook can turn over billions because of the ever more precise way it handles all the information gathered. And it doesn't come much further than we're very sorry for mistakes we made and we have a lot of learning to do. When you ask them about the very scandals and we have too many to tap into here to really talk about what happened and how we can prevent them in the future. And I've mentioned Facebook a couple of times. Uh, I know they're under a lot of scrutiny, but just because they're visibly targeted now doesn't mean that they're the only company that is doing these kinds of things. I frankly think that this kind of naivety stands in no proportion to the power 
tech companies have, and with great power should come great responsibility, or at least modesty. Some of the outcomes of pattern recognition or machine learning are reason for such serious concerns that pauses are justified. And I don't think that everything that's possible should also be put in the wild or into society as part of this often quoted race for dominance. We need to actually answer the question collectively, how much risk are we willing to take? Here too, we don't have to start from scratch. In Europe, we have a principle called the precautionary principle. And the idea is that, for example, when you look at GMOs or new medicines and other innovations where the impact could potentially be huge, but the societal risks are still unclear, that you wait a moment and research further before it is, for example, standardized or uh, licensed. And it's, it's always ridiculed, uh, especially by Americans, as unscientific, which uh, recently it was discovered that two years after a big announcement of the success of a, a genetically manipulated cow, it turned out that during the gene editing process, bacteria that also caused antibiotic resistance uh, entered into this cow, uh, and it was found out two years later scientifically discovered, I should say. So sometimes time helps, uh, and especially when risk is, is significant, uh, time and a bit of uh, pause, I think, is, is not ill-advised. At least, there should be systematic impact assessments, parallel learning processes in the public interest when AI is developed. For example, when data cannot be anonymized or is very easily re-identifiable, we should limit the use until that problem is sorted or if facial recognition systems are irreconcilable with the right to privacy, then there is a legitimate ground to ban its use, not only by governments, but also by companies, because we know how easily technologies proliferate and we don't want to create more asymmetry between governments and companies here. Now, Rob said it, um, the EU has adopted a number of regulations, uh, causing some to call it a super regulator, which when I was uh, in, in the midst of it, it didn't always feel that way when the sausage was being made. But uh, certainly, uh, I think it is very, very good to take the approach when regulating to see internet users not as products or consumers, but as citizens. And the general data protection regulation will hopefully also lead to, for example, higher standards of data for artificial intelligence development, as well as to data protection. We have net neutrality, cybersecurity laws that are steps in the right direction. I was not personally as happy with the new copyright directive. Um, and there's multiple challenges that Europe still faces. For example, without growth, um, it will be very difficult to actually set standards on the basis of these uh, agreed principles and, and values. And I think this is where the EU really has to step up. Meanwhile, we see development where in the US there is a catching up on the notion of regulation. San Francisco, interestingly very close to where these technologies are developed, uh, has banned facial recognition uh, as, as to be used by uh, the government. Um, Uber and Lyft drivers can no longer just be seen as independent workers. California has a privacy bill and the hearing of Mark Zuckerberg looked like serious um, grilling. Um, I think it is interesting why some companies do and other companies don't uh, appear before hearings. Um, but in any, in any case, such hearings, even though they're quite spectacular and it's very important that lawmakers get the questions that they want answered, they can't substitute regulation and laws. So concluding, uh, I see a clear momentum now between the EU and the US, significant part of the thankfully democratic parts of the world, where we can catch up to fill the regulatory gaps for platforms and other digital service and anticipating the broader use of artificial intelligence. I'm convinced the question is not whether there will be regulations, but who sets the rules. And I hope that between the US and the EU, but with partners like Japan, hopefully India, we can build and develop a democratic governance model for technology and AI. And here I think it's very clear that tech companies cannot stay on the fence in taking a position in relation to values and rights. I personally believe that a 
rules-based order serves the public interest as well as individual and collective rights and liberties that companies benefit from, but that everybody has a role to play to also contribute to the common interest and to strengthen the resilience of our democracies. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Thank you. Oh, it's okay. Thank you. Thanks. I'm glad it, it, uh, it rings a bell here with people, and I hope we can work on it further as I start here um, at Stanford. We have about a small half hour left for discussion and Q&A, and I wanted to kick off uh, the exchange with one question, which is, um, you talked a lot about the possibilities of the technology. You've, you've had a lot of leadership roles in various capacities and continue to have uh, leading roles. And what interests me also from the perspective of having served as a politician and thinking about democracy is who do you see as your constituents? From who do you want to get a trust mandate, if we can call it that? Do you think about the American people uh, in your work with the Department of Defense or a more global constituency or the employees of the companies where you lead or customers? Well, in the Google context, the answer has always been the customer came first. Mm -hmm. And the reason that we disagreed with a number of the initiatives that you mentioned was we disagreed on principle that this was in the best interest of customers, right? And I can, it's a longer conversation, but I did it for decades. Um, and the reality, if you're CEO or a board member of a corporation, is you have many constituents that you have to serve. The government, who is a monopoly of regulation and you have to follow. Um, one of the bizarre problems with running these large multinationals is that governments don't agree on really fundamental things, and so you end up with these very complicated geopolitical things. Um, so for example, France will try to pass a law which will cause uh, censorship of a certain particular thing in Google, and they want it to apply to the world, and then there's a complicated legal process where it's decided that applies to, to France or the EU and not, not the US. Yeah. We saw this, for example, with the right to be forgotten. Mm -hmm. But in any case, you're con you asked a constituency question, so you've got your employees, and employees today are much, much more active in the governance of the company and what they want to do. Yeah, we've seen and that. And we've seen that, <laughs> we've seen that quite a bit. Um, you have shareholders, right, mm -hmm. who matter a lot. But it, it used to be, when I was young as an executive, the answer was the CEO served the shareholders. That's clearly no longer correct. It's mm -hmm. now shareholders plus governance plus consumers plus partners plus employees and the local community. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you for that. I'm sure there's a lot of questions in the audience. You can ask them to either one of us. Uh, and I think there's people walking around with microphones, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, uh, John. Yeah, and, he's uh, coming. You should say thanks to John and Feifei for organizing all of this. Yes. <laughs> so, Rob did the work. So I guess this is a question from Richa. So I liked your talk very much, but one of the things that you um, came down at a different spot from where I would come down is on the issue of uh, whether of regulating too soon versus regulating too late. Um, it seems to me, I've always been an advocate for not trying to regulate before we fully understand the technology or, or having legislators that don't understand the technology writing the regulations. I think that's not, not helpful. I actually think that the example of the San Francisco uh, banning, total banning of the use of facial recognition by governments is not a good, is not a good example of regulation. I think it's, there are a lot of uses that, that we should allow and a lot of uses that we should not allow. I agree with that. So it seems to me that the real question, it comes down to the question of what we want is regu we want regulations that are just right, sort of the Goldilocks regulations. We want them that uh, prevent the bad things and allow the good things, mm -hmm. roughly speaking. And we kind of agree on what are the good things and what are the bad things. So the, we're going to get it wrong uh, either way, if we hold off and don't regulate or if we regulate too soon. We're going to get some things wrong. If they're not gonna, it's not going to be perfect. It seems to me that the question then is where 
we, we will need correction. Mm -hmm. And is it easier to correct regulation that has been written that is bad, that is over-regulating a, a technology, or is it easier to introduce regulation that prevents things that have been abuses that have appeared and, and become manifest, so it prevents th these bad things later on. Mm -hmm. I don't know the answer to that, but that seems to me to be an, a really important question. It would seem that adjustment could be made, uh, we could easily step in and say, well, look, Facebook or whoever, uh, you've been doing this, and we think we now understand the technology. We don't think we should allow that anymore. Now, the problem, of course, is the huge pushback that you get. Can the regulators, the legislators, mm -hmm. actually make that happen? Mm -hmm. So, so there's, my question is just, you know, what do you think about where the adjustment is most easy to or most likely mm -hmm. to come about? Thanks. I, I, this is a very rich question, and let me try to just touch upon a few points. Uh, one thing is the notion of getting it right. You know, the, the, the thing is, of course, nobody will always agree. There will always be people who disagree with any law, and that's the good thing about a democracy. N not everybody agrees. But what I think is, is a hugely important momentum now is also for governments to innovate the way they regulate because technologies d generally develop very fast. You know, it's, it's clear that they develop faster than democratic decision making. But the question is, where do you start? Do you start with the technology? Let's stay with your example of facial recognition. And do you then say, we have this technology, how do we regulate it? Or do you start with the principle? Let's say the right to privacy and we empower the regulator to assess whether facial recognition or a university or uh, the supermarket violates your right to privacy and, and that that regulator is empowered in ways, the appropriate regulator, so it could be antitrust for antitrust cases, could be non-discrimination for uh, you know, the, the equal, um, equal treatment watchdog or the civil rights uh, watchdog in any given country. I think of this as a need for a framework regulation where the principles are anchored very firmly. And this also allows, for example, for broader agreement to be sought between the US and the EU on free speech. I mean, we are, compared to the rest of the world, very much aligned, but our laws are very different. Europeans don't have the First Amendment, which is really you know, sacred uh, for many people in the United States. We have some exceptions. How can you come to, uh, let's say, standards on speech, standards on the processes of uh, exception and how it should be dealt with online, and then empowerment of regulators to even if next year there's a new technology or in five years there's another new technology, that we don't have to rewrite the laws all the time. And the empowerment of the regulators to do such, I think is challenging enough. Uh, and, and that's you know, another challenge that I, I don't wanna leave unmentioned. When Congress announced it was going to do an antitrust investigation, Tech companies hired a whole army of, of lobbyists, 75% of which New York Times discovered come from the very offices that are going to be responsible for the antitrust work. So the revolving door and the question of how, how can governments stay up to speed in terms of knowledge in a highly competitive space where the best AI engineers and experts and researchers are bought away with huge uh, salaries that governments can never pay, is, is something that also is part of this information deficit uh, that I think we have to address, which in turn is necessary to overcome this accountability deficit or accountability gap. So these are just a few hints. We can talk about it longer and I hope we'll have a chance to. Let me go um, over there for a moment and then come back to the front. The gentleman with, yeah. Good morning. I'm Joe Fish Kay. I'm Principal Research Scientist at Mozilla. Um, one of the things I thought was really interesting was the parallels between both what both of you said in your talks um, and Eric's points earlier around um, evening the playing field and things like that. And I want to ask you in particular what you thought about that as applies to data. We know that we're in this new world where data is how we make new decisions, right? Uh, you, you know, uh, Eric, your point about taking the Uber here, right, and about that maps data that enabled that uh, is really crucial. And if you think about the old world of algorithmic w uh, innovation, the way that you make new things in the world, new patents, whatever, is you come up with new algorithms. But we don't have that anymore. You don't really come up with the algorithms. Everyone's using TensorFlow. I mean, great job. It works super, right? But everyone is using 
the data that they have. And that means that we have a data regime that reinforces the existing power structures. Um, we've, in, the, in an algorithmic re regime, I mean, there's problems with patents. We, everyone in this room would agree there's problems with patents. But in patents, at least, after some period of time, that knowledge goes out in the world, right? That's the whole point. You have a patent for a limited period of time. We don't have that with data. And so we have a system now in which that data is reinforcing the existing uh, hierarchies. And I'm worried about what that does for innovation. Is that something that you see legislation coming, issues coming, where we're actually going to address that? Or are we stuck in this world in which the innovation comes to those who have the data right now? Do you want to go first? I want to answer the regulatory question. Sure. Well, I mean, the notion that um, some of these technologies exacerbate already existing inequalities of all kinds within societies, uh, globally speaking, uh, in the sense of competition, you know, newcomers able to catch up, uh, which I briefly mentioned, uh, I think is a, is a big challenge. But uh, specifically when it comes to the public interest, is if I understand your question correctly, so the notion that, you know, the, the data sets may, uh, may not be perfect, which we know they're not, but let's just for, for the sake of the example assume they're not perfect, uh, they will then be used and iterated and used and iterated and used and iterated. Uh, and then uh, how do we know exactly uh, what's going on if that information never becomes public, right? Similar to the, the patent discussion. So this is where I think the question of maybe parallel tracks of, of research in the public interest and the use of algorithm is, is um, uh, legitimate. So especially when the function and the, the outcomes impact the public interest significantly, let's say healthcare or uh, traffic or you know, things that, that are very much a part of society, uh, then I think it's absolutely uh, important that regulators um, and others who have the role to safeguard the public interest as well and to enforce laws have access to that information and to those, those outcomes. So uh, I, what I think will happen is, is depending on its use. In some uses, this may not be uh, required, and in some uses, it, it may. But the idea that companies can can take over more and more uh, vital functions without having accountability towards the public, I think, is unsustainable, as we've seen. But regulation has to catch up. The, uh, you can imagine a number of data data repositories that would be run by the government, that would be opt in, that would be address some of the questions that you're asking. To me, the most interesting trend is not that data is becoming more valuable, but rather that algorithms are being developed that need less data. So in other words, if you think data is the new oil, your oil may become less valuable over time as research is showing us that we can learn on much smaller data sets. And that's a welcome, that's a welcome innovation. And I think that will mitigate some of the concerns that you, that you mentioned. Can I ask a follow-up question? Is, is that the ability to uh, do more with less data, is that a level playing field or is that true for those who have been able to get to that point on the basis of having had access to a lot of data, like the big company? Um, well, this, this stuff is open sourced and the models are typically made public, so mm -hmm. they're open to anybody who's got a computer. Um, I suppose there's a, you need some amount of training computers and, and so forth to do it, but I think it's pretty open. Um, this technology, which we seem to have forgotten, is largely open source, largely available to everyone in the world. Uh, your discussion is largely about the, the issues of regulation and companies and so forth. Uh, it's a two-edged sword, remember, because this stuff is coming all out, there's gonna be an awful lot of ethics issues because people that we don't necessarily like, right, in other countries doing these things, right? So in your model, uh, we would some to come to some agreement over, for example, surveillance or face recognition as a better mm -hmm. example. Uh, we can't agree on, on even basics in that area across governments. So it's not obvious to me that we're going to end up with a, a common agreement on those issues. It's much more likely that some of this technology will be diffused and have negative outcome. And to me, that's the more concerning ethics issue. So, yeah, so I, that's another question that uh, I think it's really important. So have you seen in any of the uh, roles you had with Google or, or what you see now in Alphabet or the broader market, where companies that have an opportunity to roll out in a market where, for example, human rights are violated in a way and that those human rights violations could be exacerbated by the avail availability of the technology and that the decision is made we're not going to go into that market. 
because we don't want to take the risk uh, or we won't, don't want to be instrumentalized in, in that sort of dynamic. Um, I, sh I shouldn't comment about companies other than the ones that I'm familiar with, which is Google. Uh, Google has a complicated debate about every product in every uh, country. Uh, I'll give you an example of the Innocence of Muslims video. People may remember oh, yeah. this from 10 years ago, which is like a disaster. And what happened was uh, this horrific video was uploaded, uh, and then it had a huge impact in a number of countries. And so what we did, is, this is a decade ago, we geo-restricted it so it wasn't available. Right? So that's an example mm -hmm. where you say, oh, yes, we, you know, we love these American principles, but the fact of the matter is this, that, that this video, which was essentially a spoof, was causing real damage. Mm -hmm. And so we reacted. There, that happens every day in these large companies. And then is, is the benchmark um, physical harm, which I believe in this case of this example that you mentioned about the innocence of Muslims, it was also about violent protests where people were getting hurt, or is it also about human rights as a, as it's, a it's, continuous it's any, benchmark? It's any form of government policy or concern. Mm -hmm. So in Google's case, we have a whole set of rules about these things. Mm -hmm. But you'd be surprised how much care goes into these things now for the reasons that you described. And is there also contact with um, public authorities on this? They call us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they still use phones, OK. Um, any other question? Yes, sir. Uh, ben Schneiderman, University of Maryland. Uh, thank you both for <clears throat> exceptionally clear presentations and thoughtfully nuanced ones. Uh, the focus, though, is both on the notion of what I would consider prospect of regulation by government. An important force, and doing it right is important. But I'd say the, the ecological system of independent oversight is much richer. And don't we need to build other structures that, for example, retrospective analyses of failures, a, a national algorithm safety board to fly in and investigate disasters, flash crashes, and real aviation crashes or machine damage, et cetera. Uh, don't we need also the, uh, the role of the traditional auditing companies, the PwC, KPMG, Deloitte's, don't they have a powerful role in influencing the companies through their annual independent audits? And don't the insurance companies play a necessary role as they did so clearly in the, in the building construction industry to support building codes and provide insurance only if demonstrated safety has been addressed. So it seems to me there's a wider ecology that would support and maybe reduce the fears of regulation because others would pick up on the varieties of independent oversight that seem to be necessary to produce the, the trusted, reliable, and safe systems we mm -hmm. want. But in the last few years, all pretty much every corporation I'm familiar with has gone through essentially a computer security audit and that's typically driven by the insurers and the liability of the board. So I think that's a good example of your point. Um, this conversation has sort of forgot that we collectively as businesses are subject to the laws of the countries that we operate in. And I can tell you there's a lot of them. And we're subject to all of them, every single one of them. And even if they disagree by country, we're subject to all of them in each of the countries. And so I would be careful about building any form of additional regulatory structure that's extra legal, right? In other words, if you, if you're, if you want to do what you suggested, Ben, uh, then you better write it in a law that applies to everybody and can be codified in law. So the notion of, for example, hey, there was a crash and we should investigate the crash of an algorithm, that's a pretty big expansion of government role. And you might want to think a lot before you make that proposal or it's an unintended consequences. I, I think the agencies yeah. like the FDA and NIST and FTC are each moving toward doing that on a local way, which I think is a more natural way. I don't think a broad agency, but a narrowly focused one, is within existing uh, review boards to retrospectively analyze failures. No, but I, I want to pick up on something Eric said, which I think is really important, because the agencies typically, especially in Europe, they can only assess in the majority of the times whether existing laws have been respected. Uh, in the US, sometimes the agencies themselves set norms as well, like FDA, I believe, does, uh, et cetera. Um, but so empowering the agencies 
of all kinds to reach into the new domain that the technology may uh, create with their same mandate, right? Public safety or maybe even aviation, et cetera, still requires to, to look against a standard. Uh, and then I think the sort of post-mortem on damage, I think it, it could be uh, foreseen that if a crash, I mean, if it's a small scale crash, which, you know, of an algorithm or an attack or whatnot, that didn't impact many people, could be a different case than if you have negligence in the way software was built, which has exposed, you know, the data of, of hundreds of millions of people. Um, for example, when this company was trusted to run, I don't know, voter registers or whatnot. So there is a group called the Federal Trade Commission which largely regulates the tech industry, which has found most of the companies in violation of one thing or another over the last 20 years that I've been dealing with them. And so I would be careful to first understand what mandate they have and what they're doing before you ask for a broader, or for a broader expansion. I would be very careful about additional liabilities, those sorts of things, um, be, because of the, of the many possible impacts. The, the regulatory structure that you describe in Europe, um, which Europeans like and is legal and, and so forth and so on, has the property that it has increased cost of operation for small companies in Europe, right? This is just a fact, and I know this because my friends in Europe tell me this. That's okay, right? That's a deliberate decision. But it's important to understand that all of these things have costs as well as benefits. Oh, yeah, I fully agree. And I'm curious to see what's going to happen in both the U.S. and the EU when it comes to liability. Uh, for, for example, content of platforms. I think it's going to be a hot, hot yeah, and, debate in politics. No, but if you look at, at liability for content, uh, the vast majority of the social network systems rely on users to upload uh, content. And shockingly, there are users that upload bad content. <laughs> wow. And furthermore, there are people who do criminal content, which is illegal. That's mm -hmm. why it's called criminal. Uh, they upload copyrighted content, which is a violation of copyright law. Uh, they upload information which decided to misinform. So from my perspective, all of those are undesirable. I think it's very difficult to then write a rule that coherently addresses all of those that then becomes an algorithmic inspection group, et cetera. I think it's a, it's a leap. I would be very careful to understand that the companies, uh, YouTube, for example, deals with it every day in all sorts of ways. Uh, and they're not perfect, but they certainly understand these issues and they make these decisions dynamically and they're completely subject to the laws of the countries that they're operating under and they're well aware of it. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I mostly agree that it's, it's not a good idea to offload all these responsibilities on the platforms and just say, you know, figure out what is undesirable, illegal, harmful uh, speech and whatnot. But on the other hand, the status quo, I think, is, is more than not getting it right all the time. I mean, if you have number one recommendations on Amazon when you look for a book on vaccinations, some kind of book I found when I looked for an example once when I wrote an op-ed called um, Melanie's Marvelous Measles, which was a book that celebrated having measles and was obviously part of a whole anti-vaccination uh, movement. We've seen conspiracies rising to the top of search results as well as other. If I may, do you think that the companies that are offering that like those answers? They probably think that those are wrong answers and they're probably trying to improve their algorithms to reduce that, right? Well, maybe, but not right. all companies are the same. And um, what you know, what the company doesn't like may have a different reason than what is harmful for society. So, you know, as a lawmaker, and I think that's good practice too. I've I've never gone with what companies told me they liked or didn't like. I've tried to look at how you create a level playing field. <laughs> to. Um, Try to create a level playing field because, frankly speaking, and, and you know, this is to to uh, to really underline that there are now companies under enormous scrutiny that all of us know and that we have opinions about, and we can choose to you know delete or whatnot. But there is also massive companies like data brokers, to name one example, or also the creators of hacking and, and surveillance systems that are being exported to military intelligence uh, all over the world whose names we don't know that are under very uh, little public scrutiny, but that are still uh, causing a lot of harm. So uh, I think it's a, it's a diverse field, and uh, you, you happen to know a lot about company that's very well known, uh, but that's not, not all that we regulate for. Um, we have time for one more question. Way back. Yeah. 
behind you, I think the gentleman with the hat you meant, right, Eric? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you both. I'm, I'm reminded of, I think, Jeff Goldblum from Jurassic Park. From a tech industry, we spend all this time, uh, from a scientist and research perspective, thinking if we can, not whether or not we should. And it seems that there's a collision as well, societally, between uh, the move fast and break things mentality. And from a tech industry, from a, I would say, a capital markets perspective, as to it's all about who's fastest wins. Uh, how do you get to market fastest? Uh, the economics trump everything, growth at all costs. And if, from the, the corporate perspective, and this includes for startups as well, startups are just trying to survive. They're trying to get to the next level. But once they get to the next level, then it's, hey, how do you grow fast enough? How do you gain market share? And how do you become the category leader? How do we balance that? How do we set the guardrails in place so that it isn't this growth at all costs? It isn't this move fast and break things because just because we can doesn't mean that we should because of the unintended consequences that, especially from a technologist, the technologists generally are not out there thinking about how the bad guys might deploy technologies. Uh, and, and I would hearken to Brad Smith's book, Tools and Weapons. You can use a, you can use a, a broom to sweep or you can use a broom to hip, hit someone over the head. So can you comment on, on that front in terms of this collision, I would say, of the, the capital market system of we've got to move fast? Well, so my answer is you're describing companies that are not going to become great companies if that's, those are the principles that they operate under. Certainly, certainly you want to grow, but you have to grow responsibly and you have to do the right thing. Uh, Google certainly has had a belief system in t inside of it for a long time. You can debate it, but we under internally we understand it and we can express it and we can express why our decisions have followed from that set of principles. And it's very much a cases where we would make decisions that were not about absolute growth. A typical example is that when I was CEO, we would have some complicated ad system change and we would give some of it to quality, some of it to revenue, right? We, 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 had, we, knew, we understood these balances and we had the authority and the ability to build a greater company as a result, greater in terms of impact and scale and values. So the scenario that you described, which is startups that are sort of out of control for growth, that's just bad governance, right? That's a bad CEO or a bad board or what have you. You're not gonna create great value with that approach. Very briefly, because we're out of time, uh, but I think, I think the question of growth at all costs is really scrutinized everywhere. Uh, I think a lot of talent that the tech companies want to attract are looking for more value than the value of money. They also see the homeless people in the streets in the areas where they live. They can afford homes themselves. Uh, and, and you know, also with a lot of focus from a young generation on the environment, for example, sort of the, the cost of growth um, for the earth. Uh, is also a factor that is becoming more prominent. So these are not static concepts, is what I wanted to end with. These are, you know, where is the, the limit? Which laws do we think are legitimate? And who gets to decide are exercises that society uh, creates uh, by, by participating in democracy and, and changing laws if they don't work, updating them when necessary, uh, creating new ones uh, when it's needed. So um, I also hope that every one of you feel empowered to do something about uh, the change you want to see in the world. So thanks, Rob. Thank you.